Hi everybody. About eight months ago, I purchased the book, One Good Trade Online. In one day I read it, next day I read it again, and I loved it. I started following SME Capital, and uh, just the whole blog, and I really got involved in the concepts. And the more I learned about just Mike Fiore and SME Capital, I said, man, this guy really knows his stuff, I'm really learning a lot, but it would be so cool to actually meet him. So this seemed like a pipe dream, but Mike Fiore's uh, his own personal motto is almost just make it happen. So I figured, you know, why not make it happen and see if I can get him to come to IU. Well, sure enough, after a whole bunch of time and, and effort and just pure luck, uh, I'm very happy to say the following. Let us all welcome Mike Bellafiori, author of One Good Trade and co-founder of SME Capital. All right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, that introduction. You should really only read my book once. <laughs> How many people in here are interested in being a professional trader? That's a lot. How many people are interested in being a professional researcher? You're at a little bit lower end of the food chain than a trader, but um, <laughs> why do I say that? Why do I say that? And you raised your hand right there. Why would I say that about research as opposed to trading? Well, you know, I guess on the sell side, just because you're like the information set for the uh, trader. So, you know, they come to you for information and they expect you to always be able to be there for that. No, that's right. You, you are, the trader is, is in the end making the decision as to whether or not to buy a stock. Not in any way to suggest that you are not important. But, now why, for the people that raised their hand, somebody, let's do this again. Who wants to, who actually wants to be a trader? All right, now why do you want to be a trader? Uh, you get to make decisions, interpret information, strategy. All right, who else? Just speak up. Yes? Uh, the challenge of it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you mean by that? Well, I just, <clears throat> just the competition you're competing against everybody. You know, it's kind of really testing to see if you got it. All right, who else? Yes? I want to make money. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do here today is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be a trader, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you become actually good as a trader. More importantly, how you become good at anything. And then at the end, I will actually show you a trade where you can perhaps make a lot of money. Uh, one of my favorite trades. And if you are so inclined, maybe tomorrow you can start banging away and, and seeing if it works for you. All right, but to me, if you want to be a trader, I think the most important thing is that you ask yourself whether or not you really have a passion to want to trade. And I think wanting to make a lot of money is not a good enough reason to become a professional trader. If your goal is to make a lot of money, it's, it's not going to happen for you. Okay, there has to be really something inside of you that just is interested in, for whatever reason, is interested in the way Adobe stocks go up and they go down. And when they don't go up, when they should, and when they go down, there's there's got to be something that makes it makes sense to you. All right, there's something inside that, that, for whatever reason, when you pick up a newspaper, you really are flipping to the business section. When you're going online, for whatever reason, you're not stuck on ESPN. You know, you're going to have normal returns or seeking alpha, just naturally, because you're competing against the most competitive people in the world, and they're not going to just let you make money. You want to make money. You have to actually be great at this. All right. All right. So improving your chances. Let's say you actually want to get a job as a trader. How do you do it? Who has a couple ideas? Who actually has a job as a trader? Raise your hand. Who actually wants a job as a trader? Raise your hand. All right. So throw out some ideas. You want a job as a trader? How do you do it? How do you improve your chances? Yes, sir. That work. That work. Okay. What else? Yes? Uh, high GPA. <laughs> no. <laughs> start trading on your own account. Okay, yep, start trading on your own account. That's very important. Uh, anyone else? Yes? Keep up with news. All right, keep up with news. Again. I'd say uh, stay get really good at LSAT the... scores. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. what you said? You said get very good at LSAT scores. Okay, uh, no, I was saying uh, like mental math. Stay fresh. Okay. Anything else? Marry a trader's daughter. 
<laughs> that's, that's for you. <laughs> All right, so trade. All right, I think that I think you should trade. It's so easy to open up a trading account. It doesn't mean you have to open up a fifty thousand dollar account. All right, but look, I mean anybody can go to Schwab or E Trade or wherever you wherever you want to go, and you can pay for trade, or you can up a, open up a small account, and you can just start trading. And I went to and one of the advantages I live in New York is they have something called the 92nd Street Y Lecture Series. And there was an author there, and his name is Daniel Pink, and he wrote this book, Drive. And it's the best selling book. And so he was in law school, and he was at the bottom of his law school class. And the reason why I was at the bottom of his law school class is that he wasn't going to class, and he wasn't reading about the law. He was writing. He would. For 15 bucks, write an article for some magazine that very few people would read. Or for 25 bucks, he'd write another article for something that was read even less. And, you know, people would ask him after he wrote this really famous book, well, what should you do when you graduate? And what's the most obvious answer? You know, if you ask your parents, what, what should you do when you graduate, what do they say? Get a job. What's that? Well, what should you do? What job should you get? My dad told me this. My dad told me, you know, find something you really love and do it. Has anyone ever been told that? That's pretty common, right? If you know, your parents, I'm sure most of our parents have said that. And Dan actually spins it a little bit of a different way, which is don't actually do what you love, do what you do. You know, and so when I talk about being a trader, being a trader is like playing center field for the New York Yankees. I mean, let, let's not this is something else. This is not a job that you go to and you stay for 30 years. This is not a job that they have one end of the year review and if you're mediocre, you're staying. You're not. The market is going to eliminate you. Okay? And you can be good during certain years and the market can eliminate you the next year. You can make seven figures for multiple years and never be able to make a dime for the rest of your life. Right? And I've seen it. All right, I've seen, actually, the guy that I actually learned from was one of the 50 best traders I've ever seen. And he made so much money that he's retired. And every once in a while, he comes back and he actually tries to trade. And he can't, <coughs> excuse me, he can't make money. And, uh, you know, really, because he's not into it anymore. He has a lot of money. You know, and he's just, why should he trade? Like, why should he, he doesn't need any more money. You know? It doesn't mean anything to him. All right. Start trading in college. So don't tell your professors I said this, but trading is a skill. And if you think about it, you know, if there's going to be a player from Indiana University, there used to be a lot of players, right? Who's actually going to go to the NBA? <laughs> they played in high school, right? And not only did they play in high school, but they were an All-American in high school, right? Probably. They're probably a McDonald's All-American. School, right? And then when they played in college, they were certainly an All-American in college, right? The NBA is not going to draft them in the first round or so if not if they weren't very successful in college, right? But in trading, we have this thing where, you know, and I think you said it, we look at somebody's grades. What the hell does somebody's grades have to do with how good of a trader you're going to be? Trading is a skill. If you got an A in geometry, if you got an A in calculus, what does that have to do with you being a good trader? With looking at charts, with being able to control your emotions, with being able to find new patterns that make sense to you. It, it doesn't apply. All right? And being good at trading is, you know, your geometry geometry grade, grade is, is just as relevant as how good of a basketball player you are. All right? And so and I think a lot of people don't get that. I think there's a lot of firms that don't get that. They think, let's just hire the smartest people, and we'll give them some money, and we'll let them figure it out. No, absolutely not. You have to actually have a passion for it. All right, I've been writing a little bit about this. Uh, why aren't universities teaching trading in college? Because I don't know why people don't start earlier. I mean, it's, it's the same about going to Duke and trying to make the MBA. I certainly see a lot more college traders trading, so if you want a job at a firm, 
the first question I'm going to ask you is, do you have a track record? Are you trading? All right, what are you reading? All right, let's, let's talk about it. You should be able to tell me the last trade you made, and it shouldn't be two years ago. All right, it should be, I traded LBS. The reason why I traded LBS was X, Y, Z. All right, that's a good interview. All right, uh, let me just take a step back. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. I'll answer it, even if it's not on the topic that I'm talking about. This is certainly not an exercise of me practicing my presentation skills. I get enough of that. All right, so raise your hand, jump in there. If anyone wants to disagree with, yes. And lady in the back. What's your passion about trading? What, what, what attracted you to trading? Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's a long story. Um, I got into trading, I was in law school, and I recognized in law school that I really didn't want to practice law. And I knew that because I looked at the work that lawyers were doing as like doing a book exam, a book report, every day for the rest of your life. You know, you were reading something that somebody else wrote, and you were essentially copying it or paraphrasing it, and then putting it together for a partner or somebody else and then sending it to a judge. And it just didn't make, it just to me, it, it just, it wasn't interesting. It was kind of interesting, but it wasn't. And I had a good job lined up, and a safe job lined up, and I knew exactly how much money I was going to be making, where I was going to live, you know, I was destined for upper middle class, you know, suburban Connecticut, you know, hanging out with the insurance executives in Farmington, and, you know, playing at the Hartford uh, Golf Club. I mean, I could, I could just see what was going to happen. And I was at a dinner party, my best friend um, from home, his roommate from Wharton, kind of courted me at a dinner party and told me about this thing called electronic trading. And he told me that I could make $175,000 in my first year. And they told me that it was pretty cool. And I didn't have to wear a suit. And uh, that, was just the, that was just the minimum I was going to make. And you know, I, I don't know. That's how I got into it. I said, this is cooler than my other alternative, so let me get into it. But I didn't do well at the beginning. And it took me actually getting to the point where I really took it very seriously. Um, and I really started to enjoy it before it worked for me. All right. Uh, what's the value of trading? Or is there any value of being a trader other than making money? Yes. I think you add liquidity to the markets. Okay, you add liquidity to the markets. Yes. Uh, what is trading's greatest reward? What's the greatest reward? You become a trader, all right, and you are working at Goldman Sachs, and what's the best thing? Any parents say, what's the best thing about your job? What is it? Well, I, I'm just going to warn you before I actually answer the question. I'm completely set you up. That slide to set you up. So think very carefully about what you're about to say. Well, for me personally, it's a recognition. If I'm competing against 20 other traders, if I'm working for Goldman Sachs, then I would say to be the number one trader, to be recognized for, for it. All right, your own ego. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people like that. What else? Yeah. I think having a strategy and then seeing it over the long run performing and being the positive for the you know, It's like you put so much effort in and then the end works. So. Okay. Anything else? Yes, again, Mr. GPA. <laughs> if you were actually on my desk, I would call you GPA. It would give me a nickname right away. <laughs> um, I'd say probably this worth money because it's just quantifying your success. I'm sorry, wait, what is it? Money. <laughs> you probably should go hang out. Uh, who else? Who, else? who agrees with that? Who thinks it's money? Raise your hand. <laughs> we, we do these free seminars in New York City, and so you get them for free. And whenever somebody actually answers that in one of these free seminars, I threaten to kick them out of the seminar, which is obviously not a big cost to them since it was for free. But so you guys agree. What, who's got another answer? Yes? It's the thrill you get from it. It's like a fast-paced environment. It's different than most other workplaces. 
experience and knowledge you obtained in the industry to deal with all these other companies. Anyone, anyone else? <coughs> yes. About developing yourself. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you become a good trader, you're not going to make a lot of money. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you make a lot of money, that a lot of people on your desk are not actually going to know who you are. And actually, I wrote about this in my book. What happens when you actually start to make a lot of money on a desk, it's like people just congregate next to your desk at the end of the day. They just, it's like you know bees to honey. They just come off, and you are the coolest person in the entire universe. Okay? And whatever you say, it could be on who's going to win the NCAA championship is the smartest thing, the funniest thing that anyone's ever heard. Okay? And they're just thirsting for your, the next syllable that's going to come out of your mouth. Okay? And so, yes, you will be recognized. But really the greatest thing about being a trader in the end is that you become an elite performer. What does that mean? That's by far the greatest reward. And if you can't actually get to the point where you can become an elite performer, you can't make a lot of money, you can't be recognized, all right? You're going to be out of the industry soon. It's about being an elite performer. What does that mean? It's like, it's like trying to be like Kobe Bryant. I mean, Kobe Bryant is not, it's not Kobe Bryant because he wants to make a lot of money, right? You know, Barry Bonds before he took steroids. You know, it's not about necessarily making a lot of money. What does that mean, being an elite performer? What does that mean? Yeah. You're trying to raise new standards for what, what that level of success should be. Okay. What else? Yep. For being the best you can. Yeah. It's about being the best you can be. You know, there's, we all have traits that we'd like to fix, right? Some of us are not patient enough. How many people lose their temper too quickly? Okay, gentleman in the uh, red polo. Guess what happens if you do not solve your problem of being impatient or losing your temper too quickly? Guess what happens? Won't be able to keep a job. Yeah, the, the market, without any appeals process, comes to your trading account. <laughs> and it removes lots of money from your trading account, <laughs> you can't get it back. There's no like extra credit paper you can do to actually get it back. It's gone. And, and being, being a trader is, is almost merciless. You, you can't actually have certain foibles. If you're impatient, the market's going to find that and take your money. If you lose your temper, we call it trading on tilt. If you trade on tilt for a morning, you can lose twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars That can be, you know, two months. You know, that could be a month. And, you know, you have to get better. You have to. And most people go to a job, and there's things the boss asks them to do better, and that person goes home and talks to their significant other, and is like, can you believe my SOB boss had the nerve to correct me on certain things? And they never change. They never get better. They continue to do the same thing. They keep going back to their job. And, just on and on and on. And trading forces you, because the markets change. Trading forces you, if you want to make a lot of money and you want to be recognized, it forces you to be the best person you can be. Okay? And, and it's, it's not a coincidence that you know, Paul Trudeau Jones happens to also be in type of shape of somebody who's 20. You know, box. Paul Trudor Jones is one of the great traders of all time. We need boxes. If you ever go to Paul Trudor Jones's office, um, we actually, I've been because our trading coach now works for him, uh, Dr. Steve Barga. They have a trainer for every person who works at the firm. You can get a trainer to work with you in the morning for free. They have food that they'll prepare for you in the cafeteria. Why? Because they're interested in you being the best person you can be. Okay, so it's about, you know, you'll be a better son, brother, friend. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. It's about being the best you. <laughs> this is a great picture. 
All right, so how do you become a great trader? You're all committed now to being the best you, to being an elite performer. All right, you're now not going to be impatient. You're not going to get angry too quickly. How do you become a great trader? Besides sparring 10 rounds every day and getting an amazing physical shape, how do you become a great trader? Yes. So, I'd say you have to be able to adapt. To good. Very systems. good. I agree with that a lot. Going to change on you. Very good. What else? Yes. Reflect on your weaknesses. Okay, good. Yep. Experience. Okay. Hard work. Okay. Yep. Luck. Okay, that's part of it. <laughs> yes. Luck in the sense that there are certain markets that uh, you're not going to have a chance in. And 2002 is a market you're not going to have a chance in. Um, anyway, look, there's, there's really a bunch of really great books that were written recently. I, I write about this a lot. Talent Code by Dan Coyle, Talent is Overrated, <coughs> Outliers, Mindset. And a lot of these books teach people how to become good at anything. If you want to become good at anything, there's a code to it. There are certain things that all really, all the best people in anything, in business, in music, in sports, they all do the same things. Over and over again, they do the same things. All right, and if you want to become a great trader, you have to do these things over and over again. All right, so what goes into being a great trader? Domain knowledge, intrinsic motivation, critical feedback, purposeful practice, law of talent, growth mindset, new playbook. Let's talk about these things. All right, domain knowledge. This means you gotta learn everything you need to know about trading. All right, you gotta read, you gotta watch. All right, but here's my problem with a lot of the education that's out there. There is somebody like myself who wears a suit like myself, who stands in this position, who talks at you about a very simple trading setup that he's learned, which is interesting since I'm gonna do that later, all right? And he talks about you know this play, and he puts it up on the board, and he shows it to you, and you listen to it, and you understand it, and that guru, and the student think, that's it. I learned this play, and therefore now I can become a great trader. I've learned that support play. I've learned this simple trading setup. Maybe the guy writes a video, or a blog, or a written lecture about this. But this is not the way you can become a great trader. It's the first step, all right? But it's, you can't read something and become great at it. You can't read how to shoot a basketball and play in the NBA. Okay, you can't read how to actually play a support play and trade for Goldman Sachs. All right, so it's some examples of domain knowledge, some of the things you're going to learn. Psychology, selection, developing your playbook, how to read the tape, understanding the level two, technical analysis is important, fundamentals, principles of elite performance, controlling your size, sizing. All right, intrinsic motivation, what do I mean by that? very much relates to passion. You want to be a good trader, you better have an awful lot of intrinsic motivation. What is it? You want to be a good accountant. You know, you want to be the best accountant at your firm. You better have an awful lot of intrinsic motivation. All right, what is that? Yeah. <clears throat> like working hard for yourself on the amount of motivation you want to do because that's what you want to do. You don't want to do it for the money. You don't want to do it to impress your boss. You want to work at it really hard on this. It's your own goal, your own integrity. Okay. What else? Yep. Maybe after like eight or nine hours at the desk, picking yourself up and saying, you know what, I'm going to crank out another three or four hours of looking at charts and stuff. <coughs> Just because you want to do well the next day. Okay. What's the single most common complaint about your generation? I hear from a lot of people. Please. Yeah. We want to have things given to us. Yeah. We want things given to you. We want to start at the top. Right? You know, I don't, you know, maybe it's because we're, you know, your parents, maybe partly my parents, we're really the first generation of, of American parents who really had some money. And, you know, probably a lot of us, I would just suspect even at the school, a lot of people grew up in, even if you're middle class, pretty well. You can probably afford to go to this college. And, yeah, I mean, you're all told you're special, right? As 
like the new pet, you're special, right? Everyone, everyone's special here, right? And, you know, you are. You are. And you all can become great at whatever you want to be. But, you know, I remember my dad on his hands and knees scrubbing the tile on some real estate that he had bought. And I know that if you want to become a good trader, you know, you want to leave at 4 o'clock and be a good trader? I think, really? You know, good luck. Good luck with that. You, know, you want to become a great consultant and, you know, not work 12 hours a day at the beginning of your career? You know, good luck. And, yeah, I mean, there needs to be something where we don't have to watch you work. You're just doing it. You're ripping through charts. You know, every day, consistently. You're doing the work. All right? All right, and this is a good shot. This is Kobe Bryant. This is actually the better story about Kobe Bryant. It just happened recently. And Kobe Bryant is you know, one of the great players in the NBA, and he didn't like actually his results in a particular game. He's on the road. Anyone know the story? Yeah. <clears throat> is it the one where uh, they uh, they lost the game at the end and it was a close game and then he ended up staying after and just shooting for like I forget how long it was but a very long time after the game was over even though he had had the game and like two or three hours of practice already that day and yeah that's what he did <coughs> you know they actually think they had to let him in right. At the like the security guards let him back in, and he was like shooting for so long. The security guards were even like, "Dude, did you make like twenty million dollars? Like I gotta go home," and he wouldn't leave. And you know, that's what you gotta do. Those are the types of things you gotta do to become whatever you want to be. All right, will you practice? Critical feedback. There's no. This is a great book. Bounce. There's no evidence at all of anyone actually becoming great at anything without critical feedback. And I actually put up this picture of Bobby Knight, and I think he's probably a pretty controversial person here, right? Some people think he was abusive. Some people think he's the greatest thing ever. I think the one thing that is true about Bobby Knight is that he gave feedback to his players. And you need feedback in whatever you do. That's actually one of the things that will make you better. All right, purposeful practice, turning one day into 10. For us, that's important though. So you trade one day, that's one particular rep. But there's ways to actually accelerate your learning curve by making one day into 10. So we write in our trading journal. We think about trading, we talk about trading, we talk to our mentor, we visualize the trades, we watch film, we watch film as a group, we trade on a simulator. All right, we do this every day in certain trades. Instead of just having one day of practice, just one experience of trading, we have 10 days of trading. And how many people read Outliers? Yeah, I mean, Outliers is a 10,000 hour rule, right? No one's really become the Beatles. Everyone thinks the Beatles just walked on, walked into the States and became great, right? They were just this insane. No, the Beatles actually played like these nine hour concerts for years and had put in 10,000 hours of work before they became great at anything. And it's the same thing with trading. All right, you gotta put the time in. All right, luck, who said luck before? All right, what did you mean by luck? Well, you don't know what's gonna happen. Even if you look at all the stats, I mean, there's always something unexpected that's gonna pop up. So, you really can't prepare for it. Yeah, but, you know, when you're a trader, though, you're gonna get to the point where you understand certain trades are gonna work and certain trades are not gonna work. And, what you're really doing is finding patterns where your win rate is pretty good, your risk reward is controlled. And so, yeah, one trade might work out better for you than the other, but it's it's not luck. There's it's just it's actually a matter of time. <coughs> because you're just you're becoming an expert in certain patterns, in certain places. And then you're just waiting. All right, but there are certain markets that you just can't make money in. I think 2002, I think people who started in 2009, I know it was a very, that was a very difficult market. All right. So, you know, when I, when I started, I started during the Asian financial crisis. It was down $36,000. I hadn't made money for eight months. I didn't have any money left. You know, it was, it was tough.
tough time to start. <clears throat> All right, talent. I don't think talent is really as important as people think. These are great books. We talked about them. talent is overrated, balance, talent code, mindset, the art of learning. You shouldn't actually graduate. They shouldn't let you graduate from this university until you actually read these books. All right, there's, when you read these books, you learn. You're not, you weren't born a great trader. Does anyone think that that's not true? I don't think you actually have to be born a, a great trader. It's just not true. It's, there's no one, no one was like gifted with this gene to be better than somebody else to trade it. You just work at it. All right, anyone ever read Carol Dweck? This is, this is definitely a book. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, who knows what the growth mindset is? Written by Carol Dweck. Alright, good, we'll talk about it. Um, so, look, when you're out in the real world, you have a choice. You can have a growth mindset or you can have a fixed mindset. And a growth mindset means that every day you're going to try and get better. You make a losing trade, you're not discouraged by that. It's just part of the process. Right, you make a winning trade, you don't think, oh, you know, I'm just so talented as a trader. All right, every day, you're trying to get better. And if you're not doing well in the first six months of anything, what does that say? Let's say you start a job and you don't do well in the first six months. If you have a growth mindset, what does that mean? Yeah. The next six months, you have a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, it just means that as of right now, this is how good you are. It doesn't mean that in the next six months, this is how good you're going to be. All right, and it's, if you think about that, there's a lot of people walking around who think if they don't get something right away, they're like, I guess I'm just not that talented in that area. And it's complete fiction. Nobody's really talented in certain things. They work at them, they get better, and over time they become good. All right, so if you're a trader and you have a fixed mindset, you have a losing trade, you're, you're going to be distraught. If you're a trader and you have a couple of, of bad months, you're going to think, I don't have talent as a trader. If you have a growth mindset, every day is going to be, let me journal, let me talk to other people, let me use this trade as a learning experience, let me use this losing trade as a learning experience. All right, uh, you have developed your playbook. You should develop your playbook, one that makes sense to you. All right, what's the most important factor in being a successful trader? <coughs> being good at anything. Yeah? You should be able to control your emotions. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Having a plan. Okay, anyone else? Discipline. Yep. Discipline, good. Yep. Practice. Practice. Good. Right. Don't get greedy. Agree. Okay. Good. That's not the answer. <laughs> Have a good mentor. All right. And let me explain this. This is important. All right. You want someone who's actually gone through the battles. Someone who will guide you. It doesn't have to be somebody on a desk. You have to work with Goldman Sachs. Have a good mentor. Uh, you can reach out to anyone online these days. All right, there's a lot of people that will help you. But everyone has a unique personality. All right, if anyone's ever read The Art of Learning by anyone ever seen the movie uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer? It's really a no one's really a better example. Anyway, the <laughs> kid in that movie wrote this book, The Art of Learning, and he talks a lot about. Josh talks a lot about. Lives in New York talks a lot about, um, we all have a unique personality inside of us. He was a world-class chess player. And he started to, at the end of his career, work with somebody who made him trade, made him play chess in a, in a style that it wasn't good for his personality. It was, it, was, it was too slow for him. He was more aggressive. And this is the same with trading. Certain people are going to be momentum traders. They're going to want to be in it. They want to buy things. Certain people are going to want to be value traders. Yeah, they're going to be nice and slow. Things need to make sense to them. There's a lot of different ways to trade. And you have this unique personality inside of you. And you need to build from it. All right, this is true of you know whatever you're going to do. 
And the focus, if you have a good mentor, is on building this foundation from your unique personality. Some people shouldn't be momentum traders. Certain, certain, some people shouldn't be intraday traders. Some people shouldn't be swing traders. Some people shouldn't be long-term traders. It's just, it's just, that's just the way it is. It's not building from your unique personality. Some people crave the action. They can't work at a hedge fund. Right? And so when you've built that foundation, anyone ever actually, anyone here think they have a feel for the market? really setting you up now. <clears throat> Anyone have to think they have a feel for the market? Everyone watched the market and thought, I just have a really good feel for this day. Good. Very good. But you don't. Alright? Because there's no such thing as a feel. There's something called intuition. And what's intuition? It's when you've done something for a really long period of time that subconsciously you really can get to the right answer. You can't explain it, but you just can because you've done something for so long. You want to take that foundation, add intuition, intuition and, and your creativity, and that's how you'll equal your potential. All right? And this is true of anything. Don't let anyone, wherever you go, put you into a box that doesn't allow your unique personality to really, to really grow. All right, I promise this trade. <clears throat> so, let me explain my favorite trade um, quickly. Grim, this is a trade eight month high, you can see on the board, was above 67. So we're looking at our technical levels, and we see that if it gets above this price, that's pretty good. <coughs> One Tuesday, it closes below that 67 level, so it's still below that important eight month level. All right, so technicals, we're not ready to go yet. All right, intraday fundamentals. For us, we want to find stocks with fresh news, the stocks that are up are down 3%. Something that was unusual, something that was unexpected, something unexpectedly good or something unexpectedly bad that was announced about a particular stock. We call that in play, a stock that's in play. When, when that happens, everyone wants to buy and sell the stock. They want to get into the stock. All right? And so, you know, on this day, for whatever reason, Citigroup upgraded the stock to a buy. Okay? And look, at this point, Normally, if Citigroup were to actually call you up on the phone and say to you, you know, Mark, why don't you buy 100,000 shares of Citigroup, what would you do? I would hang up the phone, all right? I would ask them to call somebody else, because why do I want your advice? But, you know, in, in a market that's actually really strong, you know, it was meaningful. All right, so Wednesday opens up. It opens up above 67. So we got to, we're clear on our long-term technicals, right? We're above resistance. We've got the stock with fresh news. But, as you can see from the chart, as it opens in the first 45 minutes, it can't actually get above this 67.35 area. And I drew a line right there. And it finally did. So we buy the stock. All right, so we look for something with fresh news. We look for something that has actually clear sailing on our long-term technicals. Look at our charts. Above 67, there's no resistance. On our intraday charts, we actually see the stock is trending up. All right, we want it to be past 10.15 in a particular play. And then we want to actually hold the position. All right, so I'll do it again. All right, we want a stock with fresh news. We want a stock that actually has a clean three to five point uh, move ahead of it on its technicals. We want it to be trending intraday. We want it to be past 10.15, okay? And we want to actually hold the stock. So my question for you is, you, you know, I, I actually told you that I would share this trade with you. So now everyone is ready to quit school, right? And you can quit. You're done. You can you know, tell your parents, it's done. I'm ready to go. Send over $100,000. We're going to run this trade. I actually have a friend. I'm going to actually have him run the trade with me, too. And in about six months, I'm going to get ready to actually retire to the Caribbean. Where would you like to live? Right? That's what's going to happen clearly, right? Disagree? I just look. I just look. I wrote a book for God's sakes. I wrote this book. And not only write this book. This book is the number one selling trading book in the entire world. Okay. I just actually flew on AirTran, which is actually held together by Scotch tape. I actually made it here. All right. And I sat up here and I actually did have a suit on for at least most of the actual presentation. All right. I actually run a firm, and I just told you my favorite trade. How the hell are you not going to become rich? 
Did you want to say something back there? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. But why not? I risked my life on that, on that airline. Right? <laughs> there was like five miles an hour of wind, and the plane was like shaking all over the place. Imagine if there was actually really wind. Oh. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. That's right. You know, I mean, I don't understand. Like, you have to become, you guys are all destined to become rich, right? I don't know when to get out. Okay. I don't know when to get out, but I mean, you're going to get out, you'll need money, right? <laughs> I mean, I mean, so you won't be as rich. So instead of living in the Caribbean, you're going to have to live in the Keys. <laughs>
do the same thing over and over again. I trade stocks that sometimes I've never even heard of. In 2007, I didn't know what a subprime mortgage actually was until CFC started to go down five points in the pre-market. That doesn't, that's not because in some way I'm dispassionate about trading. All right, it's a meritocracy. You don't have to go to your boss and beg for a raise. You have a big scoreboard. It says how much money you're actually making. You get a cut of that. All right, it doesn't get easier than that. If you actually make money for the firm, they're going to give you more money and you're going to get paid more money. Yes, the lifestyle is very good. Some of the things I tend to like to go to Nobu. I like my Yankee, my Yankee season tickets. I do like to travel better airlines hopefully next time. <laughs> it's a present activity, all right? You're in the moment. It's exciting. You know, your heart does kind of, I wouldn't say pounds, but it's interesting. I have 10,000 shares in a particular position, and if it works, holy crap, I'm going to make $25,000. And if it doesn't, holy crap, I'm going to lose a lot of money. That's interesting, okay? <laughs> You get to work with great people, people who want to trade, that would be interesting. And the most important thing is, it really is about being your best you. All right, I will take some questions. Um, if anyone, well, I'll take some questions. Yes, in back. Oh. The guy doesn't trust for? himself. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's our mentor? Uh, well, who's my mentor right now? Yeah, I can't tell you who my mentor is right now. But he is a very, he won't allow me to say it, all right, but uh, it's a pretty well-known person. Um, and I have one. And I have one. I have run a firm, and uh, I've traded for a long time, and I have one. Has he, has he, he or she been a mentor throughout your career? Or is this, uh, He's not going to mentor you. <laughs> no, he's not. He's not asking. Has he what? Has he been your mentor? Yes, for not for the entire time. Okay. For the last uh, many years. Other questions? Yes, Lance. When you you were telling about how you when you first started you had trouble in the beginning yes. and wasn't making profit for a while. Did you ever think of quitting? And what stopped you from quitting? Um, I don't know if I really. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I, th I think that we were on this sh uh, show called Wall Street Warriors. Anyone ever see Wall Street Warriors? Yes. Does anyone recognize me from Wall Street Warriors? Wow. You know, one guy actually came into my office and said, uh, yeah, you're on Wall Street Warriors. You really gained a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> Is Leticia still around? Leticia. She, uh, she never traded with us. She did, her, she did the training and then, and then she went out to do something else. Um, so what was the question? Did you ever think of quitting? No, it stopped you. So on that show, um, I have this scene, and what I say is, and I don't actually remember exactly what I said, but I'll paraphrase again, which is the market gives you an opportunity to doubt that you actually are going to become a successful trader. It gives us all this opportunity to want to think we can't do it. And at that point, you actually have to push back. And I was actually sitting with one of my guys uh, this week, and I said that same thing to him. You know, his confidence was a little bit low. He wasn't sure he was going to ever make it. I'm like, this is the process for a lot of people. You should think like you're not going to make it. Now, what are you going to do about it? All right, you're still here. We haven't fired you. Although, if you come back in and keep talking like this, I might. But, uh, yeah, you'll doubt yourself. And, and, and you'll doubt yourself even after you make money. And you just have to keep, you have to keep pushing back. There's always a solution. For whatever you're doing in your trading, always a solution. Always something you can do better. Yes? How do you feel, this may be a long answer, but just as brief as possible, how do you feel about... Can I drink like, this water? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, quant traders and yep. basically algorithms and um, firms that rely on stuff like that to basically replicate what you were doing? Um, I don't know if they do that. Um, I'm actually talking about this tomorrow in, in New York City. Um, and you know, there's a lot of press about high frequency trading. Yeah. And high frequency trading is algorithmic trading. Computers make trades so fast, your eyes can't even see it. They can buy a stock and sell a stock, and your eye can't even see the trade go across. And 
they've taken away certain plays that uh, intraday traders or certain types of traders used to make. They took away certain momentum plays and they took away certain scalp plays. And there are certain algorithms that will mess with particular patterns that people are trading. Um, they cause stocks to touch more prices, which causes even long-term traders or swing traders to get stopped out more. They make it harder to get positions at, at certain levels because they can just cut you and cut you and cut you. Um, you know, my feeling on the whole thing is there are certain parts of it I think um, aren't fair. I think the market should be fair. I don't think the fact that somebody has their servers co-located at an exchange should give them an advantage over somebody else. Um, and their argument will be, well, why don't you just move your servers? Well, it's, you know, we all have to really do that. So I think there are certain things that I don't like about it. But what I really don't like the most about it is when people spend 99% of their time trying to say that the reason why the markets are the way they are is because of HFTs. I don't get that. You know, trading is about sometimes dealing with what it is. It, it's, it's not always going to be fair. I mean, I, I guess it should be. But if you're a trader and you spend time thinking about all the things that are unfair, we could sit here, we could have a course at this school on all the things that are unfair about the markets and trading. Okay? And the problem is that if you're a trader and you become an expert in that, well, you're not becoming an expert in actually making money. So, um, the other thing I, I, the other thing that worries me about quant trading is that it's expanding too quickly. And I think that you, I think most people have to learn how to trade to build an algorithm, um, or they build a dangerous algorithm. Uh, I think, and because it's the past doesn't necessarily predict the future, and you can go rip through numbers and, and find patterns, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to continue. So. But the best part of it is that it's, it's an evolution of technology. For me, I want to be able to trade all the different markets. I want to be able to trade a whole bunch of different products. And anything that advances technology, which is really at the best what HFTs are, I want more tools to actually help me find more trading opportunities. I want platforms where I can trade more than one product at the same time. I want platforms to get better so I can, I can trade Hong Kong and I can trade Australia. And I want it to be easy for everyone. And so that's the best part of HFTs. So, um, but they're big players. I mean, they're the, they're the guys that are probably making the most money on the street, the guys who are really good at it, the Wolverines, the, the Jane Street Capitals, the, the Getcos, the, you know, those guys are making a lot of money. Good for them. Yeah. Just as like a quick follow-up, so like in May, when the whole, Happen. I mean, how how would you react to something like that? How would I react to it? Yeah. Or how did you? We we didn't. It was so fast. We didn't do anything. Um, that was the flash crash. Look, people blame it on the programs, and I think <coughs> the one thing that gets left out is that you know what was going on that day. Do you remember what was going on that day? You could see. I mean, in our trading floor, there was. You know, does anyone know what was going on that day during the flash crash? Yeah. We were one of the traders in a small big firm in Kansas City. Uh, placed the order for instead of a million, a million shares for 10 million shares. Can I get back to you? Because that's true too. Let me get back to you though. That's good. But before that, what was going on? Hey, sorry, that stuff in Europe. <coughs> Specifically what country? Uh, Greece. Yeah, there was rioting in Greece, on the streets of Greece. It was on TV. And then, go ahead. Yeah, he believed that um, which would be a true religion right away. Um, so, made so there was, and there, so there may have been um, a, an erroneous order that got put into the marketplace um, with the psychology of there's rioting in the streets that caused the market for a short period of time to go down. Now, look, I will say this: there aren't market makers like there used to be back in you know the 80s and the 90s who um, had a responsibility to make market when things got crazy. So, you know, it's true, you know, maybe the market went down a little bit too far than it should have. Maybe some people should have stepped in at certain times. Um, but you can't forget those first two facts. 
and the reality of the situation is there aren't market makers anymore. The market makers are the HFPs. And if you want to do something about that, I think that's probably a pretty good idea. I think that's probably, I think we probably need that, or else I think we're going to start to see some of these dips. And uh, before I talked about this at a conference, and it, you know, you bring up the flash crash, which is a really <coughs> interesting anecdote and got the most press, but there are people that do research and they'll find individual stocks that have crashed like that at a much higher rate and a much higher number than we've ever seen in the past. So if you're an owner of a particular stock and you have a flash crash in a stock, a particular, and you get stopped out, you're going to be, you're going to be pretty disappointed, right? So probably uh, it's, 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 it's an issue. It's an issue. Yeah? What do you think about um, the increasing amount of government innovation, inno intervention in the market? Is that necessary? Is that good? Do you think that will continue? Can we turn the tape off? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't know. I don't specialize in, in policy. I'm going to let you know, Chuck Schumer and whoever the head of the banking um, is. It does affect you, though. I mean, I'm not an expert in it. I'm just not. And it does affect me. Um, my issue is this. The more regulation that there is, the more expensive it is to trade. That's just the way it is. And um, there certainly are whispers that the government wants more regulation for traders. And firms take steps to get in front of government regulation. So they're, they're compliant. A good firm wants to be compliant in everything they do. Um, and so you spend more money, even if the government doesn't do anything, just if they whisper that they're going to do certain things. And so that gets passed along to the consumer. And you know that makes it harder for certain people to trade. And look, I mean, you know, if you're working at the SEC or if you're working, if you're in Congress, don't you have a pretty tough job right now? I mean, you know, you had some of the big banks come before your committee and tell you that everything was okay, and then their companies are bankrupt within days. And, you know, one of the most recognized people in Wall Street apparently was swindling $8 billion from people who are also pretty rich. And who do you, be who do you believe? Like, who would you, who would you listen to? Somebody came in from the street and started to talk to you about certain regulation that, that was needed, or wanted to fight certain regulation, why would you listen to them after what happened in 2008? So, um, you know, look, I think that we had the housing crisis because um, there was no regulation at all. It's very new, very complicated derivative products, and, you know, certainly that's not a great idea, right? Probably shouldn't bring down the whole house um, or something like that. So, you know, you'll see it. There's going to be leverage issues. Uh, there's going to be regulatory issues. Some of it will be good. Some of it won't be good. We just have to move forward. What do you think? I think there needs to be more. There's going to be more. Yes. Completely different now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience on Wall Street Warriors and whether or not you liked the way they portrayed you, didn't like it, like how was it with you know cameras? How did you think that they portrayed us? No, I don't think they portrayed you in a bad light. I thought it was, I mean, I, I was a big fan of the show. Uh, I was just wondering if it was you know, a lot different, like having cameras around and uh, people acting differently, or if that's, you know, you guys still were able to do everything on a daily basis that you would. Um, it was a long time ago, and as someone actually has pointed out to me in an interview, I was a lot thinner back then. <laughs> um, I thought that uh, they did a really good job. I think that they weren't really there that much. Um, I think our firm is so much better at what it does now than back then. I wish people actually could see what we do now. Um, but. I did a really good job, I and mean, I think it was kind of neat to be able to see certain things like talking on a headset, like you know having an AM meeting where you're, you're looking at charts, like seeing that you can go and get good training um, from a from a desk that's going to work with you um, minute by minute. So, uh, and 
and it's funny. We, you know, we've done a lot of things that are a book, and we have a much bigger firm than we did back then. And people recognized me from that show in the strangest places. I was working out. I was in the Caribbean um, with my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and some guy came up to me while I was working out, and. Uh, you know, it was weird. It was like in this little dinky gym. He's like, you're the guy from Wall Street Warriors. And it's like, leaves his wife and comes running over. And <laughs> <laughs> like, I am. So, uh, it's weird. More people recognize me from that than anything else. Or, or heard about us from anything else. And I think we've done uh, a lot of things so that surprised me. You know, we've been on CNBC. We're on Stock Twits. We're all the time. But that's still, uh, still a show. Other questions? Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, there's a lot of talk now about speculators driving up prices. Can I ask you a question? <coughs> What's your GPA? <laughs> it's not good enough. <laughs> now what should be? What's that? Now what should be. Okay, go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of talk now about speculators driving prices up in certain markets, such as like crude oil futures, and uh, there's a huge jump in the Japanese yen about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about like their role in the market? Do you think that they're going to be more regulated? And then I guess my other question would be, if crude oil futures continue rising, what uh, economic effects do you see? Uh, how's that going to affect the countries? Well, my uh, beach house is going to be a lot cheaper. That's going to happen if oil continues to go up. Um, so that would be one positive. But, you know, again, and, and I don't mean not to answer your question, I'm just not, this is just not what I'm an expert in. Um, I read, I read as much as you do on the subject. I don't have a, a more intelligent answer on that to, to offer than you would. It's a good question. Though. Yeah. Do you think with the increased high-frequency high trading that uh, technical trading will kind of die I down? I have a follow-up question to that. Oh, no, I didn't. And I have a follow-up. I don't know answer. Okay. But yeah, do you think with the increase of high-frequency trading that uh, technical trading will kind of die down within the next, like, five years? Why would you say that? I just think that high frequency trading kind of ruins any technical ideas that you have. It kind of pinpoints it, and you said that it, it drives prices to hit support and resistance and take people out. Yeah, but high frequency trading is is, uh, is also technical trading. Right. There are people that are looking at <coughs> certain trend plays, um, and they're putting on algorithms to follow that trend. I actually think there's a lot of so look, a trend starts, and there can be high frequency trading where they automatically break the trend because they know people are going to have to hit out um, artificially, and they can make some money doing that. So that can happen. But what can also happen is uh, buying, 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 buying uh, happens after a stock starts to trend because it's an algorithm that buys when they see certain setups. And so it can kind of work both ways. Um, and I would say that when stock is really in play, the stock is really hot, and HFT is not going to be able to break the trend in a particular stock. It's, it's only when something's lukewarm. And so you can change your trading style to find stocks that are a little bit hotter um, for yourself. So actually, there's more technical trading that's going on right now um, than there ever was. And, and there has to be a lot of algorithmic, technical, automatic trading that's going on. And that's why the market's um, that actually may create a market where stocks go up and down more than you would actually think because people are just kind of piling in. And that's part of the reason people talk about they're propping up the price of oil. Well, there's some automatic uh, buying that's going in um, because it's trending. Yeah? What's your opinion on value investors and people like Warren Buffett? What are they about Warren Buffett? <laughs> like just value investing in general and then followed up by Warren Buffett. Yeah, um, I think if you become good at it, I think if there's a lot of different ways to make money, and if you become good at it, and that's something that interests you, then that's great. Um, what we hear on, in the market right now is that it's hard to be a value investor right now because if you're not making money, people get nervous and they dump you. And there's a lot of so there's a lot of pressure on that. Um, I don't know what I would say about Warren Buffett. I mean, he's one of the most successful investors of all time. Um, uh, doesn't do anything, doesn't you know, think about the markets like I do, which is probably really good for him. Um, so, you know, when he bought, you know, when he bought the railroads, that became something we looked at. Um, we 
would, tr we would trade in, and he made that sector really strong. When, when the news came out about uh, Warren Buffett having a strike, uh, having the ability to buy Goldman Sachs, and I think it was 118, he had a complicated deal, but he could also buy Goldman Sachs at 118 when we were really crumbling in 2008. It was a really good thing for the market. It really slowed it up a little bit. It didn't hold that 118. It went to 50 or 49 once. But it was a level that a lot of people looked at. Okay. Um, all right, other questions? Yes? Do you recommend any like simulators? Yes. Um, which one? <laughs> I should just say yes. Um, but it's really important, because it's, it's practice, right? We talked about this. If you want to play in the NBA, you got to play high school ball, college ball. In trading, same thing. You want to get a lot of, a lot of experience. Um, it depends on what kind of product you want to trade. Well, what SMB trade? <coughs> well, we use Lightspeed. And they have a simulator? Yes. And all our guys, during the training program, they, they're on the simulator for uh, at least eight weeks. Yeah. What is the underlying psychology behind like uh, resistance and support levels for like intraday? Like how can you make sense out of that on such a quick you know, basis? Um, well, it's interesting you say psychology. I mean, that means there's people invested at a certain resistance level, and there's people invested at certain support levels. And so when those levels break, the people that are invested have to get out, don't they? And when they have to get out, you want to follow them getting out, right? So you want to be short there. Um, so it really just is, there's people, and you want to understand what they're doing in the marketplace. You want to understand their positions. You want to understand what's going to get them to sell. And um, so for, it, for those levels, that helps us. Yeah? You're talking about like buy once the support level breaks? What about like buy above the support level? We want to get short when the support level breaks, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I mean, sorry. Okay. And what about buying above the support level, thinking that it's going to hold? Do you guys yep. do any of that? Yeah, if you want to be long above the support level, you want to be short below a particular short uh, support level. Okay. Um, that's the way you want to, that's the way we trade. Gotcha. Yep. Um, you talked in the book about, about that exact play where algorithms come in, they buy prop up the price so they can get you where you get stopped out. Um, do you guys still do that kind of trade? Are we so prevalent that they, they mess up a trade like that every single time? Or? They can. There's, a, there's an algorithm. Um, so like, let's say that something breaks a really important support level, right? Yeah. So what, we, what would we expect the stock to do? Go down. To go down, right? So what happens is that there are certain HFTs, and what they do is they actually buy. So you get short, 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 I get short, you get short. All right, and the, and the HFT buys. They buy, they buy, they buy, they buy, they buy. And then when all the short-term people are done shorting, then I, the, the, the algorithm steps higher, and steps higher, and steps higher. And you cover, and you cover, and you cover, and you cover, you cover, you cover, you cover, and then what happens? Stock so goes down right after that. So there's just a short-term play where they're trading against us in the marketplace off of that particular level. But what do you do when you see that? When you recognize the pattern, what do you do? No. You, you, what you do is you short into the algorithm. All right. So you know you can you know that it's probably not going to work. So you wait for the stock to come up and, and slow, and then you short at a higher price, and then you stay in it for a longer period of that trade. So you eliminate necessarily that momentum trade, okay? Or you trade differently, and you you, you adjust. Yeah, so you would keep the shares that you initially bought, don't cover out, and then just then make that spread as like, so when the trades are higher, then you, know, you, you buy it, and you make the spread, and you wait until it stops. You would buy, you would flip. If it didn't go down right away, you would cover, and then you would short into an up mm -hmm. And hold that short into an up Okay, you would start a longer term position. All right, other questions? <laughs> yes? Um, so you're saying different products, you created different products. When did you decide to branch out? Um, well, G-Man trades FX. Uh, we have a guy who trades options. Um, I think that one of the problems or one of the shortfalls with the kind of trading that we do is that it's only one market for one time frame. And we've noticed that there are guys who want to trade more products different time frames and we needed to get better. Our guys are pushing us to be a little bit better. So we are going to roll out an options trading program, we're going to roll out an FX training program. Um, we 
we will roll out a futures training program in the future. Um, our guys on our desk, instead of having one trading account, some have a trading account, a swing account, and an options account. And I think that the future for really good traders is for them to want to be able to trade a whole bunch of different markets, a whole bunch of different products, and a whole bunch of different time frames on one system so that they can maximize their opportunities. And that didn't used to be the case. Yes? How can I get a job at your firm? Like what specific things you trade? Uh, look, it's, it's people come in and we get a lot of resumes and I want to see that this is something you really want to do. And you know, I say this to a lot of people, I, I don't want to see you think you like trading. Come to New York, move to New York, where are you from, where did you grow up? Carmel. Okay. Sort of I don't want to see you move from Carmel, from San Diego you said? India. And, okay. I don't want to see you move, go to New York City, spend a year trying to learn how to trade and then recognize or learn then that it just wasn't your thing. It just wasn't your passion. I want you to know that before you actually become a professional trader. I want you to be trading so that there's no doubt. And um, so I want to see you trading, I want to see you reading, and you know, I, it's pretty obvious on, on some of the resume. People, we have kids, um, we have college students who come in and they put their track record <coughs> down on my desk and I can see that they're making money consistently every single month while they're in college. I, I, we have one kid who lives in, in an apartment that I'm not sure a lot of people I know could afford, okay? And he's trading in college. And he's been doing it for five years or so. And so, you know, but it's, it's really simpler than that. Like, I want you to do what you want to do. And sometimes people think trading is cool, and that's why I put that up there. It's a good pickup line. You know, it is a really good pickup line, by the way. <laughs> it is. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't hope I don't offend anyone, but yeah, if you go to a place and somebody asks you what you do and you say you're a trader, people will be more interested. Okay? Men and women, and whatever you're interested in. And so, um, meaning like the two women, anyway. Okay. Um, but, uh, It's, you know, I don't want it to be because you think it's cool. I don't want it to be something you really love to do. Yeah. So, you know, talking a lot about momentum trading, technical trading, that doesn't necessarily relate to the underlying value of whatever the stock is. Do you think that that really adds value for society? I mean, I'm not trying to ridicule the profession, but do you really think that that's a value add for the U.S.? Or what do you think? <laughs> huh? What do you think? I wonder. I mean, I think that you have to, I mean, if there's money to be made, people are going to do it. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just not sure that trading on the technicals is something that really makes us better off in the long run. Trading overall. I, look, um, I don't think that's what trading is about. Um, I think trading is, is this silly game that we play that is really a game about us being the best that we can be. Um, it's the greatest exercise in that. There's a huge value in trading. Companies need money to be able to expand. And what trading is, is the movement of money to the people that we think deserve it the most so that they can get more things. Um, people need, if you're a small business, I mean, I, in essence, I'm a small business, I can tell you that if I don't have access to capital, I can't run a business. I can't hire people. Um, I can't grow my company. So there's a lot of value in trading. There's a lot of value in the markets. It's, 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 in, its, in its essence, it's getting people money who then can grow their companies so that they can hire you. So, faster. Do you disagree with that? No, not okay. necessarily. I'm just curious. I mean, I don't know. All right, other questions? Yes? Well, um, are you seeing any trends in like, uh I guess the increasing prevalence of high frequency traders like algorithmic trading and you know, fixed income and like fixed income, especially like the left. I don't trade fixed income. Okay. Um, <coughs> so I should stop right there. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. What material would you recommend reading you decide to go your journal? But um, I mean, there's some biases out there. I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> In terms 
of news? Yeah. In terms of news? Um, Analyze the stocks and things like that. Um, you know, we don't necessarily do a lot of analyzing stocks. I just want to know what the news is. I just want to know if, if the stock is interesting, particular day. I just want to know if something's unexpected, if there's news out that's unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad. And then I'm going to let my trading skills do the work for me. I don't sit there. Something will come out with news. Let me take a huge step back. And this is why I don't do this. Um, this is in my book. And I don't know why I'm actually talking about this because it frustrates me in thinking about it. But a trader is not necessarily an analyst. All right? A trader is a trader. It's a, it's a different job. If the stock's going up, you want to be long. If the stock's going down, you want to be short. It's not for you to say whether or not it should be going up or down while it's doing that. And so there was one day I was trading SanDisk, and SanDisk actually had news out, and I thought actually the news was neutral at worst. Stock gap down, all right? I started buying the stock, went lower, I hit it. I started buying the stock more, I hit it, bought it, hit it, bought it, hit it. The stock did nothing but go down until I actually hit almost near the bottom. The only reason I didn't hit the bottom is because my partner, Steve Spencer, he hit the bottom. Okay, and we were sitting there all day, and we're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, this news, is not bad news. It gapped down, it should have filled in the gap, it should be trading higher, what the hell is going on here? And, you know, sure enough, we ripped up a lot of money that day, and guess what happened two weeks later? The stock was 30 points higher. With no new news. We were right all along, it's just we weren't necessarily right that day, or a lot of people didn't agree with us that day. So for me, I just need to know what the news is and I need to trade it. Um, but we use something called briefing.com. Um, some traders use trade the news in, in our industry. Some people look at Bloomberg a lot. I think Bloomberg's probably pretty good um, to go to. Um, but look for patterns in the news. Like for us, the patterns are unexpectedly good, unexpectedly bad. Uh, margins, beating, on, beating their margins, gaining market share. Those are things that interest me. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, um, I didn't want to interrupt, but um, you're talking in your book about stocks that you want your first year or your journeys to go into because they're just too volatile or something yeah. like that. Uh, how can you explain that? I mean, there's just regular frequent trading going on. How can you say that there's a stock that we don't want you to go into because it's just like behavior rush? Yeah, I, I actually was at, uh, I was in Tampa this weekend and I was talking with a market veteran and he actually was saying that uh, he trades second and third and fourth day plays. He finds stocks that have fresh news, he lets them put levels in, and then he waits for the second, the third, or the fourth day to actually breach those levels because they're less competitive. <coughs> he wants to trade less competitive stocks. The reason is it's because new guys <coughs> can't trade more competitive stocks. It's too hard. Every professional is banging in and out of them um, when the news first breaks. So for new and developing traders, that's certainly an option, is to be in the least competitive stocks. Another way would be in stocks that, that don't have as much volume. Another way would be in to be in stocks that don't have HFTs in it. You know, certain low volume stocks, they don't have HFTs. So you can you can do that. Slow trending stocks, less competitive. Instead of Netflix, okay, or before that travels you, or before that Google, or Baidu, okay, or maybe Amazon, or back in the day, Broadcom. All right. Other questions? Yes? Do you feel like your ball background gives you any unique advantage? Um, I think it actually hurts me. <laughs> Does anyone want to guess why? I, I have a couple of weaknesses personally, and one of them is, is because of the law. Who can guess? Yes, sir. Because of the set process, we do the same thing over and over again. Okay. Uh, Good, good, good answer. I wonder um, what the reason something is moving instead of just going with it. Say fear of breaching it. <clears throat> yeah. Kind of like with the uh, your last example, the saying this guy, uh, you try and interpret the news rather than just going with what the market's saying. Okay. Anyone else want to guess? Yeah. Just a preconceived notion as to what a stock should be. Okay. okay. For me, um, I don't like when things are unfair. I don't know why, I just, there's something that really bothers me when things are unfair. And if I see Sandus going down, 
I actually, that can be my tipping point. That can be my trading on hill. Is when I, rec I think someone's screwing me or manipulating the marketplace. And I should just sit back and be like, well, the market's not necessarily there all the time. Sometimes it's manipulated and just don't get hurt. But I, I don't know, my, that's just my, my brain. It just, it, it, it insults me. It, it bothers me. It, I just, I, I, it makes me angry. And that's like, you know, my kryptonite. It's one of my kryptonites. Um, so I fight it. I fight it all the time. I still have to fight it as much as I work on it. I just, it just bothers me. You know, the HFT stuff bothers me when, some of the HFT stuff bothers me when, you know, a firm says, you know, we're at a, we're, we're at a level playing field. No, we're not in a level playing field. I can't even see the freaking orders going out. How are we on a level playing field? My eye can't even see it. How is that fair? You know, I'm not going to put my servers in the New York Stock Exchange. It's ridiculous. I have five million dollars worth of servers right here. What I have to spend another two million dollars? You know, like that's it's ridiculous. And no, it isn't true that anyone can actually go out and buy the equipment so that you can actually trade HFTs. It's not true. It's really expensive. All right, so they, that was me being upset. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, did I answer your question? All right. Other questions. Yes, sir. What do traders do with their income? Do they retrade with it, or do they kind of save it away? Uh, you know, I wrote about this in my book. The first time I really made a lot of money, um, I went down and I wrote a check and I gave it to Mr. Charles Schwab. And I opened up the Charles Schwab account and I bought a basket of stocks, living the American dream. Because, you know, this is what you do. And that's why stocks are so awesome. That it's about hope. It's about better tomorrow. It's about making your financial situation better for some people. And you know, you wanted to, and particularly back at that time, it was you know, 2000, late 90s and 2000. And uh, so that's what I did at first. And I found that I was a really bad investor. All right, I was I was a good trader, but I was a really bad investor. Um, I wasn't really applying good trading uh, principles to my investing. And so that uh, wasn't, wasn't the, the best experience for me at the beginning for investing. But uh, you know, traders certainly put their money in the market. I actually think traders put less money in the market than maybe doctors would, pharmaceutical people do. We were exposed to the markets, aren't we? And um, it's hard to be an active trader and have your investment account tick against you when you're trading and you're short and you're long, like you're short trading and you're long in your investment and you're like, you want to hit the investment account and get shorter and it kind of plays with you a little bit. So, and then they do stupid things like buy cars and go to Barney's and buy nice clothes and go to dinners and try and take, you know, other people to dinner with them and go to parties. Go to Yankee games, travel, play golf wherever they want, things like that. Yeah. Do you think uh, insider trading is like a pretty big deal? You know, you hear a lot in the news recently about the big cases they're bringing. Do you see a lot of insider trading? I would know how to make an insider trade if you switch spots with me and actually told me how to do it. Um, we don't actually have. I actually wrote about this in my book. There's one phone that actually is on our desk, and it's for our floor manager. And this is a joke. His mother calls a lot. <laughs> um, so we're not tapped into the street. Like that's not how we trade. We don't take out positions overnight. Um, we trade intraday. Like we see something in play and we trade. It, um, it disgusts me to no end to read certain stories, and I, I will, you know, there is a recent story about a guy who was the head of equity trading at a prestigious firm. And he got insider information, and he called up his friend who ran one of the largest hedge funds and told him that tip, and that moron at one of the largest hedge funds actually made a huge trade on this information and made lots and lots of money, I, I, I find that to be ridiculous. Like, who the hell would do that? Like, what, what are you thinking? Like, that, that's your morality? 
I mean, that you would actually do something like that? Like, how is that being good at anything? Like, talk about, like, not having any value. But it's even worse than that. You're just like, there's something wrong with you. There's really something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you if you're the head of equity trading at a company making millions of dollars a year, and you get on the phone and you call your friend about something you just learned about your company, and that other idiot actually makes a trade on that? Who's, who's, who's managing eight billion? I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, and people give these people money. These people think they're important. They're, they're, they're losers. They're complete scumbags. And, yeah, that bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't understand certain things like that. And then there was that other. Yeah, so, I mean, we don't, we don't search. It's not the way that we trade, so we wouldn't. You wouldn't have much experience in how rampant it is or is not. It's very, look, it's very rampant. I mean, the, one of the really big uh, institutional firms and one of the really, really big hedge funds you know, and it's, there are rumors of other hedge funds being looked at. I just, I hope they, I mean, I think, I think those people should just be banned, go away, leave us alone. Um, it's just, I don't understand why I have to do that. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Anyone have a question? Yes. When you were talking about sadness going down, you used the word other people manipulating the market. I thought maybe. Yeah, manipulation has really negative connotations. So, what exactly did you mean by that? Like, how would the market be manipulated? Um, <coughs> meaning that should I not use that word? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Like, is there is somebody like doing well, manipulation? I don't know that anyone's manipulating the market at that time. When you think a stock is going to go up and it keeps going down and going down and going down, yeah. I think maybe your thought process is that somebody's manipulating what's going on. So I don't have any evidence that they were manipulating the trade at that point. But that does happen. You know, people do manipulate the markets. All right, one last question and then we all got to go. Uh, sorry. Okay, so how, you said you don't really, uh, well, you're not, you said so you don't have um, like a bull bracket firm that you put in owners to Correct. Your front broker. Do you use like a boutique firm or how do you do that? I, I enter the orders on my computer. I go to the computer and the platform comes up and I hit buy and then if I don't like it, I hit sell. <laughs> and that's what I do. Okay. I leave my cell phone in my, on my desk inside my office, which is anywhere near my trading floor, and I have no phone and I don't answer emails and I don't call anyone. I don't ask anyone to make any trades and I don't do any of that. I enter the orders myself. It's a really good question. I'm doing this on purpose. I enter the orders, the price, everything. Not only do I not enter the orders, I enter the price specifically to the penny for where I want to buy and sell the stock. Because it's called discretionary trading. All right. And if anyone has any questions, here is my uh, information. You can send me an email, tweet. <coughs> this is our blog. If anyone has to ask me anything after this, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot.